Basically, today we're going to talk about regularization. And we're going to start from where we left off yesterday. So at the end of yesterday, we had um, the solution of linear regression, the maximum likelihood solution. So we have our model. Um, we we'll write it as a vector with a ve using vectors here. So W are the parameters of the models. Xi's are our inputs. And Yi is the, is the label, the output we want to predict. And we have Gaussian noise, and we have a number of observations. And we can write the, the log likelihood of, um, of the data. And we end up with this kind of, sorry. Um, yep. And we end up with this kind of, of uh, solution for our, for our parameters, OK? And basically, this is equivalent to um, minimizing the, sorry, I'll just wait for a little bit. There's too much going on. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. OK. OK, so this end up uh, like we had this solution. We, we didn't go through the details of the matrices there, but this is the, the maximum likelihood solution of our parameters. OK, and we saw that uh, in um, this is equivalent to minimizing the least squares. So how far away our points are from a line, if we have just one input, how far away they are from a plane, if we have 2D, and then we talked about hyperplanes, which we can't visualize anymore in 3D. So, OK, we talked about maximizing the data likelihood. And today, we're we talked about how great likelihoods are. But today, we're going to see what can go wrong with maximum likelihood okay? and, and how we can solve it. And the, the biggest problem is overfitting. right? That's what it's called. And we're going to see what it means. So what happens is you have a, very, you have a certain data set. You've not observed everyone in the world. You've observed just some people. right? And you want to predict the rest, actually. And, but these people all have their own kind of um, characteristics, which are only their own. They don't really generalize to anyone else. Right? And this is where the problem comes. So what overfitting does is it captures, we can capture stuff that generalize across many people. But we also start capturing things that describe individual people or individual data points. And that's the problem, because that we cannot take and predict in, in future, in new data points. Okay? So we're going to see how this, um, how this works. But first, why is this a problem? As I said, in new data points, the prediction is really poor. Because basically, all of these things that you've learned for one person do not carry over to the second person. And then you just predict something that is completely non nonsense. Um, also, our solutions might become completely different. So we add just a single data point, and then things uh, change uh, drastically, which maybe is a bit uh, theoretical at this point. Maybe it will become a bit more clear later on. Uh, and our model basically only describes the specific data set. Right? So it's not a very useful model. It just describes the specific data sample that we have. So. Overfitting becomes worse when basically we have a lot of parameters we want to fit and we have few data points, right? And to give you an example here, imagine we have just this single point here and we want to fit a line. So that has two parameters and we only have a single data point. Any line is a good model for this data point, right? But then once we observe a second data point, most of these lines will be completely wrong, right? So these are all bad models. And in fact, um, in biology or in biomedical applications, we often have these settings. So we have a lot of parameters or a lot of covariates that may have something to do with our prediction problem. But we have very few data points that we can learn these about, right? And, and Yuri and Janine have talked about this. Um, Bonferroni corrections of our p-values and things like this. This is because we have so many things we want to test and very few data points. Um, okay, and this is often referred as the large p, small n problem. So n is the, the number of data points that we have and p is the number of parameters. Um, so we have a lot of parameters 
and, and few data points. Um, right, so I want to show you how, what overfitting looks like, but because we can't have many covariates, we can't visualize this high dimensional space, we're going to just use a, a, a more complex model to see this. Okay, so instead of linear fits, now we're going to use a polynomial model. Okay, so as before, this would be our linear model. We have the intercept and we have the, the slope, but now we're going to have a second <coughs> parameter for the square term of x and the third parameter for the um, cubic term of x and so on. Okay, so, so basically, again, we're going to write this as w transpose xi, but now xi is going to be just x on different polynomial orders, right? So we have one as before to multiply with our intercept and we have the linear term here and then the, the quadratic, the cubic and so on, okay? And this is again, it has, you can see here that it has p parameters. So the order of the polynomial is the number of parameters that we will have in the model, plus one for the intercept. Okay, so let's see how we can fit this, right? So imagine we have these 11 data points, the blue dots here, and now we fit a line using the least squares, okay? Do you think this is a, is, this is a good fit of the data? Yeah. No, probably these are too far away, these are quite far, so not great. So let's fit a second order. Mm. Better. Mm -hmm. Now let's go up and fit a seventh order. What do you think? Does this fit the data well? Yes, it fits the data really well. But do you think this is a good model? Maybe too well. Maybe too well. Maybe too well, exactly. So now... So you have another point somewhere else. <laughs> you will have to change it again. Exactly. Even the biologists understand that. <laughs> biologists are smart people. Hmm? So, um, great. So, so that's what overfitting looks like, right? We have 11 data points we're fitting seven parameters and we can almost exactly fit the data points. You know, these guys are a little bit far away from, from the line, but most of them are exactly touching the line, right? And this is a number, so now the, the data points have a circle just so we can see them and we have all the different orders, right? So we have the line and this is the green as before is the seventh order and we have the, the, the the different degrees, right, uh, uh, squared and cubic and, and so on. And um, I guess we discussed this before, but from the ones that you saw, which model would you say is best? So linear, uh, squared or seventh order? Squared. Great, yeah, that's what I think too. <laughs> right, so this is the problem of overfitting, right? Everyone happy with this, everyone understands the concept. Right, we have more parameters, the model becomes very flexible, great, we can fit a lot, but we, we, we fit the training data perfectly, but we don't really believe that this complex model is true. And in fact, if we believe that our observations will have some noise, so there is an underlying process, but then when we observe the data, so the way we measure the data or something like this introduces noise, in fact, this underlying process should be smoother than what we observe, right? Because what we observe has measurement noise or observation noise or sample noise or things like this. And basically what we say here is that if we, if we want to do maximum likelihood learning, then this might be not such a good idea if we have very few data points and a lot of parameters. So there are many ways of dealing with overfitting. So we're going to go through the simple ways first and then uh, we're going to look at one way of doing it, right? So basically the most simple way could be use a simple model. You know, if, if we only have 11 data points, try to fit just a single covariate. So as Janine said yesterday, for every 10 data points, we can fit right, a, a thumb, a rule of thumb for every 10 data points, we can try and fit a single parameter or something like this. Um, so try and fit a simpler model, linear, second order, maybe something like this. 
What else could you do? What could you do if you have lots of covariates? You can try and decide which are, are important from the beginning and just test these depending on which data points you have, right? So um, use fewer inputs. Test the covariates you're most certain about. Don't just test everything. Of course, we have all these uh, uh, correction things, but if you, if you want to predict, if you want to build a prediction model, just try and use the inputs that you think are uh, more important for this prediction. Then we can use algorithmic or mathematical solutions, right? And this is what we're going to see for the, the rest of this talk. So what we're going to do now is this seventh order polynomial here, in fact, what it does is it learns very large values for these weights, for these Ws. So the weights become very large values so that they can fit the data exactly, you know. And when you get the third point, you take plus 100. When you get the fourth order, it gets minus 700 and so on. And then it can fit these data points perfectly. So what we're going to do is there. So we're going to penalize large parameter values. We're going to tell our model, you're not allowed to learn very large weights. You have to stay small. Okay, and we're going to see this just next. But there are many, many other ways of dealing with overfitting. A lot of them are model specific. Um, and also we can have a full Bayesian treatment where we basically integrate over all possible parameter settings. But this is beyond the scope of this, uh, of this um, school. Um, but we have other techniques. We have early stopping of our learning algorithms in neural networks. We have, if we have decision trees, I don't know if, if any of you know about decision trees, we can try and, and just stop again early, just prune the tree, have a shorter tree that describes the data so that we don't get more and more specific and, and things like this. So regularization, okay. The most common model um, used is ridge regression. Okay, and what it does is, you remember the least square objective from everyone happy with this part? Yeah, we minimize our arguments, W, sorry, we minimize our function with respect to our um, parameters, yes? But now we add this, okay? And we want to minimize all of this. And what does this da do, right? This is basically a sum over the squared values of our parameters, okay? So when our parameters become large, what will happen to this term? It will be very positive, yeah, because it's a square term. So it will become very large, right? So what this says is, okay, you have to minimize this, but as you increase the values of your weights to fit your data perfectly, you're actually making this whole function larger. And since you want to minimize it, it basically pushes the weights to become smaller. Good. And what is this lambda here? Well, this lambda is basically a, what we call a metaparameter, and it controls how much we want to penalize our solution, right? And in the next lecture, we'll see how we can choose the value of lambda. But for now, you can think about it as, okay, we have this function that we want to minimize and that gives us the maximum likelihood it fits the, the data perfectly. We have this penalty term and we wait between the two, which one is more important. That's what lambda does. Questions so far? Exactly. Yeah, so if this lambda... It's just linear regression. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you can only fit as much as you want. Good. So, in fact, linear regression has an analytical solution. And I don't know if you remember before, we had the maximum likelihood solution. It was something like this. Not something. It was this. And why is the vector with all the, with all the phenotypes, with all the, sorry, the outputs. And this is our design matrix. It has the inputs for all 
the individuals. So now, instead of this, we actually have this term here, that is lambda times uh, just uh, the identity matrix. So we add stuff just in the diagonal of this expression, for those of you who care about the mathematics a bit more. Um, it's not important to remember this, but just I wanted to show you how similar it is to the least square solution. Right? Um, and one thing to be careful about here, you remember we put everything, we put the intercept term inside our W to simplify our notation, right? And we multiply it by one. But here we should be careful not to penalize the intercept parameter. So usually softwares that we're going to use like GLMNet take this into account and you don't need to worry about it. But if ever you are to implement this, you need to be careful to set the lambda that corresponds to the intercept to zero, right? So we don't uh, penalize that. Okay, let's see some more. So we saw maximum likelihood yesterday, and now we're going to see another type of learning, which is the maximum a posteriori, okay? And we're going to see what this means. So, in fact, yesterday we showed, we started from least squares, and then we, we expressed our model, the, we expressed the likelihood of the data under our model, and we saw that this was um, equivalent to the least squares objective, right? Now, we're going to see how we can come to this rich solution by using this type of learning. Not maximum likelihood learning, but maximum a posteriori learning. So, in fact, we're not sure about what the model parameters should be, right? What should this weight vector be? We know that some things may be more important, some things may be less important, uh, but we don't know, right? So what, we, what we're going to do here is we'll try and represent our uncertainty using distributions, right? So we're going to say that we actually don't know what W0 is, we don't know what W1 is, but we're going to put a distribution over W0, we're going to put a distribution over W1, and this is going to represent the uncertainty, what we think W0 should be. And in fact, if we assume that this distribution is just a Gaussian distribution, then, so this is just the formula of the Gaussian distribution, so this is the prior probability of our weight vector, okay? And you remember yesterday we saw this expression for something a bit simpler, so just a single variable. So now we have the whole vector. But if we do this, we can basically use something really important, and this is the, this is the important part, just to remember this, the, for the, the exact uh, function, it doesn't matter. But we can use Bayes' rule to compute the posterior probability, and I think this is important to understand what it means. Right? So this one is the probability of this specific, a specific parameter vector, given that we have observed a certain data set. Okay? So that is the posterior probability, the probability of the weight vector after we observe the data points. Now what Bayes' rule says is that this is equal to the prior probability of the weights, so what we thought the weights should be before we observed everything, anything, multiplied by the likelihood of the data. So how likely are the data given this parameter setting? Divided by a term which we tend to ignore because it doesn't depend on, on W, but this is basically the probability of observing this data set um, out there in the world, okay? Um, so, basically this you will see many, many times because we have this, this uh, rule that the posterior probability is the prior probability times the likelihood, right? It's proportional to that because we can typically ignore this term, P of D. So, how many have I lost? Perfect, everyone's still with me. So, <laughs> um, <coughs> let's go and do some math. Remember yesterday we wrote the log of, uh, of, the, um, of the likelihood so that we can easily take derivatives and so on. Similarly, we can take the log of this posterior probability. Right, so what, what we want to do now is we want to maximize this posterior probability. So we want to find the weight vector that maximizes this. 
and that's this maximum a posteriori, a maximum of the posterior probability of our parameters. And we're going to write this, we write the terms that we have from before, because we take the log we have this expression, and this is the prior, the prior of the weights gives us this part, this is the likelihood, we saw this yesterday, right, this is the least squares, um, looks like the least squares and we have the variance as well, and this we can ignore because W does not depend on it, right, so if we're maximizing with respect to W, this term is not important. And then we just write this out a little bit more, reshuffle things, take away the minus and turn it into a minimum, and we get this solution. And this, in fact, if we take derivatives of this and put them, set them to zero and so on, this will give us exactly the same solution that we saw before. So, this one. Okay? Yep. So, that's it. Any questions here before we move on? We don't have much more to cover, so feel free to ask questions at this stage. Okay, good. I think probably I've lost some of you and the rest just understand this anyway. So, <laughs> okay, <laughs> good. Um, now, we saw what happens in REACH, but what if we believe that the, um, that actually not all of our covariates are important for the prediction task, right? So, in biology, we have this, in biomedical applications, we often have this. We measure a lot of stuff and we don't know which of these are going to be important to our output, right? We don't really know. But we know or we believe that not all of them should be important. Some of them probably have to do something with our output and we need to consider them, but not everything is important. So we have this knowledge. So is there a way to actually model this? And in fact, there is. And um, we can do this by using this method called the lasso. It stands for least absolute shrinkage and selection operator, but everyone calls it lasso. So I always have to go back and, and see what it stands for, right? And basically what happens, remember in REACH we had, again, the least square objective plus another term here that was the square of its weight. Now we have an absolute value, okay? And what this does is it pushes zero to become, sorry, it pushes parameters to become small, but it also forces some of them to go to zero. So when you get exact zero solutions, so when you get parameters that are zero, what is gonna happen in our, you, you remember our model is that, um, so when we predict, we do W transpose X, right? And this is the sum over all of our parameters of W, J, X, J, right? And what, if these W, J's are zero, it means that the covariates corresponding to them are out of our solution. We don't care about them anymore, okay? And why not deleting them in the first uh, part of the, I mean, from the beginning? Well, if you knew which ones they are, oh, of course you delete them. You learn which, okay. Yes, okay. yes. So here, you just let the data decide which ones are more important. It's not based on priors. It's a, it's a, it has a prior distribution over the weights, but this prior is what we call an uninformative prior. So it means that you treat all the weights similarly. So you don't have a, a diff, all of your weights, all of your parameters are sampled from a, the same distribution. They're independent from each other, but they have the same prior distribution. Whereas if you want to include biological knowledge, you have to make different assumptions for different parameters. Okay, so put a different probability distribution to W0 and a different probability distribution to W1 if you think that the covariate one is more important. Depends on the, I mean, the range of the variables. It depends also on the, 
this a theoretical proving or empirical <laughs> examples? Because yeah. empirical examples that you have more problems because computer cannot represent every number, then you have something that's near zero and you don't know if it's zero or not zero, so you create a kind of a problem. But if you're going to use it on your computer, then you know, if it's close to zero, you're going to say... So how okay, do you find, that's the, the question, how do you define close to zero? If it's less than to the minus ten to the minus six or something like this. Yeah. <laughs> but I think most software has have this. So if you search lasso, so if you implement lasso for the first time for a specific excuse me, for a specific data set, then probably you don't have a um, a good idea of, of of something like this. But I think most solvers have this empirically. So GLMNet would return zeros, for instance, which is one of the popular software in, in R for implementing Lasso. I think it would return zero for specific weights. But there are parameters that you can choose in GLMNet that tells what precision you want or things like this. Okay. And that's it. Well, we're done. So um, this is a summary. Uh, we, we looked at maximum likelihood yesterday, but today we saw why maximum likelihood can be bad or when it can be bad. So um, we looked at overfitting. This is the problem that occurs with maximum likelihood a lot. Um, we have this uh, large P, small n setting, where we have um, a lot of parameters but very few data points, and that's really bad. It, overfitting happens a lot in that setting. We need to be very careful what we're doing. And we saw that regularization can be a solution to this problem. Um, and we saw how in REACH um, this can also be interpreted as a maximum a posteriori solution. So we derive the posterior distribution of the parameters after we've observed the data. And we saw REACH and we saw LASSO. Okay? And this is some more reading uh, about these methods if you want. This is the seminal paper about the LASSO. And uh, this one, I think, has uh, this chapter has both reach and lasso explained, and it's uh, available online. And I'd like to again acknowledge my funders, which is Pharmatics, the BBSRC, and the Human Genetics Unit at the University of Edinburgh. <laughs>